So let's start talking a little bit about triangles. Triangles are created from three sides and three angles. Now, last semester we defined what angles were. Do you guys remember how we did that? Okay. Well, we looked at rays. Remember, a ray comes from taking a point, which is our simplest geometric figure, it's just a location, and moving it in a single direction. Remember, we said a ray was completely defined by two things, the location of that starting point, and we're going to set that location as the center of a coordinate grid. And then the direction that we moved it in. And that direction is defined kind of off of navigational style directioning, where this straight east is considered zero degrees, north is 90 degrees, and we move around it counterclockwise. So let's say that this ray is at 19 degrees, this direction. So we have a ray at 19 degrees at that starting point. An angle comes from, if we go back to that same starting point, and we move in a different direction than we did the first time. We now have a new ray with the same starting point, but let's say that its direction is 63 degrees. The angle formed by those two rays, which is this angle here, the size of that angle is defined to be the difference in the direction. 63 degrees minus 19 degrees is 44 degrees. So that is a 44 degree angle because there's a difference of 44 degrees between the directions of the two rays that form it. Now we also talked a little bit about how that whole navigational idea and directional setup is not as commonly known as it used to be. It used to be a good share of the population had an idea of, of navigation. If you said you know, 19 degrees north of east, people knew what that meant. Um, not so much anymore. So we've altered that definition a little bit. We simplified it a little bit. Where if we're going in a certain direction, if we turn all the way around so that we're back still going in that direction, how far have we turned? 360 degrees. One complete turn is 360 degrees. So if we're going in a certain direction and we turn so that we are going exact back in exactly the opposite direction, how far have we turned? That's 180. Where'd you get the 180 from? Just always knew it? There you go. Half 360. If we're going in a certain direction, and we turn, so now we're going exactly off to one side so that our directions make a square corner. That is what? 90 degrees. And of course that came from one fourth of it or divided by four. So what we've come to do is we've come to define angles as a fraction of a full turn. If I create an angle here, and I tell you that this angle is 44 degrees. What that is saying is that is 44 three sixtieths of a full turn. Which makes sense? So either definition is perfectly viable. Now we have some special relationships. You know, we said that angle is formed by taking that starting point and in two different occasions going in two different directions. But we can take that starting point again and go in a third different direction. And what we have created here is actually several angles, but we're mostly concerned about these two. We have this one here was our original angle, and then this one here, which is our new angle. Those two angles that share a starting point, that starting point, common starting point is called a vertex. 
and one side are called adjacent angles. Now, it's not enough just to share a vertex, and it's not enough just to share a side. I mean, we could have angles like this where they share a side, but they're not adjacent because they don't share a vertex. It has to have both possibilities. One of the great things, one of the unique things about adjacent angles is they're what we call additive. You can add them up. If I tell you that this angle here is 24 degrees and this angle here is 18 degrees, how do we find this bigger angle here? Well, 24 plus 18 is 42 degrees. That larger angle is just 42 degrees. Now, part of being additive is also that we can subtract them. If I tell you that this larger angle here is 111 degrees, and that this smaller angle here is 83 degrees, and I want to find this one, how would I find it? Got 111 minus 83, which is going to be 28 degrees. Maybe it didn't quite work out to scale, but you guys get the picture. Now we can have special properties with those adjacent angles. We have a case like this where those two adjacent angles form a straight line. There's a special name for this called a linear pair. But more importantly, if I know that this is 79 degrees, what do I know about this angle here? You got it, 180 minus 79. That's 101 degrees. Those two angles have to add up to 180 because they form a straight line. And two angles that add up to 180 are called supplementary. If I have two angles that combine to make a square corner, now that little square or box in the corner signifies that that's a square corner or 90 degrees. If I know that this angle here it's 29 degrees. What's this angle here have to be? Minus. 90 minus 29, which is 61 degrees. Two angles that add up to 90 degrees are called complementary. Now, if you're anything like me, the first time I learned these, I could memorize the words supplementary and complementary, but trying to remember which one was which was kind of tricky. So I remember it this way. You get complements when you are right. So complementary angles add up to a right angle or 90 degrees. Well, other relationships we can get out of those angles. Well, we have some special relationships with our lines that we can look at. One is this. Two lines that intersect at a right angle are called perpendicular. If two lines intersect and form one right angle, what do I know about this angle here? It's also 90 degrees or a right angle because... This being a straight line across here, those two angles have to be supplements. Well, 180 minus 90 is 90. How about this angle down here? Well, it's also a right angle because, again, this is a straight line, so those two angles are supplements. So, again, 180 minus 90 is 90. This one's also 90 degrees. So... If two angles intersect, if one of the angle, or two lines intersect, I guess. if two lines intersect, if one of the angles formed is a right angle, all four of them must be right angles because 
of that supplementary and linear pair relationship. Oblique is not necessarily a special relationship. It's just when two lines intersect and they are not perpendicular, they are called oblique. Let's say this angle here is 48 degrees. What's that angle there have to be? 132, very good. 180 minus 48 is 132 degrees. That is a line here, so those have to add up to 180. Well, how about this angle here? That's back to 48 degrees. Again, this is also a line, so those two angles have to add up to 180. So 180 minus 132 puts us back at 48. Well, anybody want to venture a guess as to what this angle has to be? 132, yeah. When two lines intersect, when two oblique lines, we only form, even though four angles are formed, there's only two unique angles formed. They come in pairs. These two are going to be equivalent. These two are going to be equivalent. That relationship is what we refer to as vertical angles. Well, another relationship that's also special comes like this, when we have lines that are parallel. What's your definition of parallel line? They don't touch, okay. In two dimensions, that's the most common definition, is they don't touch and they never intersect. And in two dimensions, that's adequate. In two dimensions, if those lines are not parallel, they will intersect eventually. But in three dimensions, we have to be a little bit stronger. Imagine that this is a line and this is a line. Do they ever intersect? No, they don't. Are they parallel? No, they're not. So in three dimensions, parallel has to be defined a little stronger. The technical terminology is everywhere equidistant. To put that a little bit more plain language, they're always the same distance apart. How do you measure how far apart they are? Well, you just pick a point on one of the lines. Let's pick that green point. To measure distance from a point to a line, always measure it at a perpendicular. So you go perpendicular that way. The length of that segment created is the distance. I take another point. Again, I make a perpendicular to the other line. And so that the length of that segment is the distance there. Those distances all have to be the same length. Anytime we have multiple lines, I purposely drew these oblique. Anytime we have multiple lines cut by a third line, that third line is called a transversal. Now that transversal isn't horrifically interesting unless those original two lines or other lines are parallel. Let's make them look parallel. So here's my transversal. If we look at one of the angles formed between that transversal and one of the parallel lines, let's say this is 71 degrees. What's this angle here have to be? 109. This one here, 71, and of course, 109. We saw this before with the vertical angles. When two lines intersect, when two oblique lines intersect, at the intersection of oblique lines, there's only two angles formed. And they're supplements because of the straight lines. 
So when two lines intersect, they form four angles. They're either equal or supplementary. Well, let's now come down and look at this line down here. If I were to move that up, it would actually sit. Let me get up here. It would actually sit right on top of that line. Wouldn't it? So this angle here, the 71 degrees. would be the same as this angle here. So this is also 71 degrees because they basically fall on top of each other. Well, now the rest of that falls into place then. This is 109, 71, and 109. Now, if this were a formal algebra or formal geometry class, we would talk about interior angles. Interior angles are between the parallel lines. And exterior angles, exterior angles are outside of the parallel lines. We would talk about corresponding angles. Corresponding angles are both on the same side of the transversal. Either side doesn't matter. Or Alternate angles. Alternate angles have one on one side and one on the other side of the transverse. And there is a ton of rules, like, sorry, corresponding angles and alternate angles. Let's say we have, okay. let's say we have corresponding interior angles. Corresponding means same side of the transversal. Interior means between the parallel lines. So these are corresponding interior angles. First. There's another one more set of them. What do we know about those two angles? There's some 180. We could have corresponding exterior angles. Well, these are exterior and on the same side of the transversal. They are supplementary. 180. There is alternate exterior angles. So that's on one side. This is on the other side of the transversal. Those are equal. And there is a ton of rules like that. Alternate interior angles are congruent. Corresponding interior angles are supplementary, blah, blah, blah. Well, rather than memorizing all those rules, all that we care about is when parallel lines are cut by a transversal, there's only two angles formed. Either the angles are equal or congruent, or they are supplementary. That's all you really need to remember. Do you remember if we have a triangle, if I tell you that this angle here is 56 degrees and this angle here is 71 degrees, how do I find that angle? Well, what do I know about the angle sum of a triangle? It adds up to 180 degrees. So I know I can find that missing angle. There's a lot of different ways you can do the math. I'm going to add together the two that I have. Get 128 degrees. Now 180 minus 128 is 52 degrees. This angle is a 52 degree angle. Because I have to add up to 180. That's not right. That should be 127, not 128. That makes that a 53 degree angle. That's a little bit better. Using what we know about parallel lines, I can actually show that to you. Let's put our triangle in here. So that one side is on one of the parallel lines and the vertex is on the other parallel line like that. So I have angles A, B, and C. Well, if I can imagine this side here being extended like that, what angles, what other places do I know that angle B has to be? Well, right here, correct? 
That has to be equivalent to angle B. Where else? Right here and right there. That has to be equivalent to angle B. Same with angle A. If I extend this, I know that angle A would have to be here, here, and here. So if I label it there, what do I know about these three angles? They add up to a straight line, which means they add up to 180. So no matter what shape the triangle is, the angles always add up to 180 degrees. So we've looked at right angles. A right angle is 90 degrees, or square corner. What if I have an angle that is smaller than a right angle? Does it have a special name? It's called an acute angle. Think of it this way. Usually things that are acute are small. So acute means smaller than 90. If I have an angle that's larger, some things you can't on here, guys. If I have an angle that's larger than 90 degrees, that is called obtuse. An obtuse angle. I always think of obese. Obese means larger than normal. So normal is actually another word for, for perpendicular or right angles. So an obtuse angle is larger than a right angle. <clears throat> when I form triangles, one of the ways I name a triangle is by its angles. So I might have a triangle that's like this. The largest angle in that triangle is still less than 90, so it is acute. So when I'm naming it by the angles, I look at the largest angle. If I have a right angle in that triangle, Come on, there we go. If I have a right angle in that triangle, can any of the other angles be obtuse? No, because I have 180 as my angle sum, right? Well, 180 minus 90 is 90 degrees. So that 90 degrees has to be split between two other angles somehow. So neither one of them can be more than 90. So in a right triangle, the largest angle will be the right angle. That's called the right triangle. It is possible to have one angle of the triangle be obtuse. Of course, that would be called an obtuse triangle. We can also name triangles by their sides. We have a triangle that has... Three different length sides. Those little hash marks indicate that those are different lengths. If they had the same number of hash marks, it would be the same length. A triangle where all the sides are different is referred to as scalene. We usually don't call it scalene. It's just a generic triangle. There's nothing special. If we don't know anything special about it, we assume it's scalene. We have a triangle like this, where two of the sides are equal and the third one's different. That is called isosceles. I always wonder if I spelled that right. We're going to call that close enough. Isosceles triangle has two sides that are the same. And of course, the third and final possibility is all three sides the same, which is Equilateral. Lateral means sides, equal means equal, so equal sides. All sides are the same. Now, it is possible to have a combination. Now, first of all, all equilateral triangles have to be what 
for their angles. Acute, right? Yeah, all the angles end up being 60 degrees, which we'll talk about in just a second. But equilateral triangles are all acute. There's no way to have obtuse equilateral triangles. In a triangle, feels like this hour is taking forever, doesn't it? In a triangle, the largest angle and the largest side are opposite each other. So like here, these three sides are the same, which means the opposite angles have to be the same. Because if one of them was bigger, the opposite side would have to be bigger. That also means an isosceles triangle, this angle and this angle have to be the same. Because their opposite sides are the same. Scalene, of course, they're all different sizes because the angles are all different sizes because the sides are all different sizes. Equilateral, of course, if they're all the same, as Tom said, they're all 60 degrees. Scalene can be pretty much anything. Isosceles. Let's just do this. Classify this for me. According to the angles, that is what? Right, right? According to the sides, it is isosceles. Now, I sometimes get asked, well, what about this side? Couldn't that, can't that side be the same? No, because it's a right triangle, that side has to be different. This is a right isosceles or isosceles right triangle. We could have isosceles obtuse or isosceles acute as well. If I give you that this angle here is 110 degrees, I can find the other two. How? Yeah, 180 minus 110 is 70. 70 divided by 2 is 35 degrees. Each of those is 35 degrees. Make sense? If I tell you that this angle here is 65 degrees, what can I do about that one? Well, this one's also 65, which is 130. 180 minus 130 Gives us 50 degrees for that angle. That's a bad? And of course, a little review from last semester. If this is 8 inches and this is 17 inches, what's that side? How would we find it? Do you remember? Does that look familiar? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So what are A and B? Okay. Yeah, it doesn't matter which one is, is A and which one's X. A and B are the legs of the triangle. They're the two sides that form the right angle. C is the hypotenuse, which in this case has to be the 17. So 8 squared plus x squared equals 17 squared. What is 8 squared? 64. 17 squared? 289. Now it's just a matter of solving the equation. We subtract the 64. x squared equals 215. Now this is like what we were talking before. x squared, the opposite of that is... Square root, x equals, that should have been 225. x is 15. Square root of 225 is 15. So x will be 15, and those units are all inches, so that has to be inches. Looking familiar?
Which angle here has to be the largest? C, because it's across from the biggest side. Which angle has to be the smallest? B, because it's across from the smallest side. So if I give you something like this, somebody give me a number between 12 and 20. 15. So if that side there is 15 inches, And I give you those sides like that. And I ask you, is that a right triangle? Obviously, a right triangle would have to be A squared plus B squared equals C squared. How do I know which side to make C? Yeah, the largest side has to be C. Because remember, in a right triangle, the largest angle is the right angle. There can't be any angles bigger than 90 degrees. So the largest side has to be the hypotenuse, side C. Now A and B don't matter. Those are both legs. So I'm just going to go A and B like that. So now I'm going to test this to see if this is a right angle. So A squared becomes 15 squared plus B squared is 112 squared. Now I'm not going to put an equal sign in here because I don't know if they're equal. I am testing to see if that is the same as 113 squared. Well, let's see. 113 squared is 12,769. 15 squared is 225. 112 squared is 12,544. What does that add up to? 12,769. Those are equivalent. So that is a right triangle. Where's my right angle? Right there. What do you think? Good enough. Okay, I'm going to give you guys some homework. Page 472, man, I'm just actually 472, exercise 20-7, 497, exercise 22-7, and page 512, exercise 23-3. Yeah, I think it is. Well, I know it's in your book, 